Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. We are in a little bit different space today, um, but I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, um, our COVID-19 uh, technical lead. Um, we will be answering, actually Maria will be answering, not me, uh, answering your questions about COVID-19 epidemiological situation and variants. Um, so please feel free to ask your questions if you're watching us on Twitter using the hashtag AskWHO. If you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, please use the use comment section to, to leave your question and I will pass it to Maria. Um, good afternoon, Maria. Uh, thank you for being with us again for your time to answer the questions from our viewers. Um, while we are waiting for them uh, to, to initiate some, uh, maybe you can also provide us with current epidemiological situation around the world and regionally. What's the situation with the number of cases and, and, and deaths? So thanks, Alex, uh, for doing this again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So if we look at the global epidemiologic situation, you know, we're still in a very challenging position at a global level. Um, in the last week alone, uh, we had more than 4.4 million cases reported to WHO and more than 66,000 people died. Um, we know both of those numbers are an underestimate of the true number of cases and deaths. Um, this puts us well over 207 million cases reported to date um, and more than 4.3 million people who've died. Um, again, we know that those are underestimates. So, it's been about eight weeks uh, since we've seen, it's been a consecutive eight weeks where we've seen increasing case numbers. Um, and it's been about three weeks or four weeks where we've seen increasing numbers of deaths. In the last week, we didn't really see a change, but 66,000 people died last week alone uh, to COVID-19. Um, when we look at the regional level, um, you know, you've heard me say this before, the regional situation is very different. Um, it's very different at national levels and subnational levels. Um, and there are, are several trends. So overall, globally, there was a 2% increase in cases um, and the deaths remained around the same, um, but we're seeing large numbers of cases. Um, you know, 4.4 million cases in one week, um, 1 1.5 million alone were in the Americas. Um, and that's an 8% increase in the last seven days. Um, in Europe, uh, there was a slight increase of 1%. Um, in the Western Pacific region, a 14% increase in cases. And there were decreases in cases in Southeast Asia and in Africa. And in the Eastern Mediterranean region, it was the same number, almost the same number as last week. So there's quite a dynamic situation at the regional level. In terms of deaths, um, we're still seeing increases in a number of regions in the Americas, in the Eastern Mediterranean region, in the Western Pacific, with declines and deaths in Europe, in Southeast Asia, and in Africa. Um, our weekly epidemiologic report will be published this evening, so there will be a lot more detail in there. Um, but it's safe to say that we really shouldn't be in this position 19 months into a global pandemic when we have tools. And um, I think this is what uh, we find quite challenging given that we don't have the tools evenly distributed around the world um, and even those that are available you know through the hand hand hygiene and mask wearing and physical distancing they're not really being used consistently uh, across the world so that's putting a lot of people at risk um, and of course you know the vaccine distribution is really quite uneven so there's a lot of challenges we face right now Thank you, Maria. And, and, and mentioning this vaccine inequity and, and, and just maybe looking into each region, we know that Africa is the region with the least access to vaccines. So maybe how does this reflect on the epidemiological situation? Well, certainly we know that there are several safe and effective vaccines and the vaccines that are available prevent severe disease. They present, prevent people from being hospitalized and they prevent people from dying and they are incredibly effective. Um, and there are many that are available around the world. However, um, the distribution of these vaccines are really, you know, only in a, a handful of countries. And so we see um, the majority of the world has not had access to these vaccines. And if you don't have access to the vaccines, especially people who have underlying conditions, um, they are at a higher risk of hospitalization and they're at a higher risk of dying. So anywhere where we don't have vaccines being used, um, people who are more exposed, so health workers, for example, and people who have these underlying medical conditions like uh, underlying heart disease or respiratory disease um, 
they will be at an increased risk of dying. So it will have an impact on mortality. And this is such a shame because to have these tools developed over years of collaboration, um, to have this acceleration of several safe and effective vaccines being available, um, to not be used to keep people alive is really not just epidemiologically not sound, but it's morally um, reprehensible. Um, and I think, you know, COVAX, and WHO and our partners are working really hard to change that, um, but it's not happening fast enough. So I think that's what we're, we remain focused on as vaccine equity, because this will save lives. Thank you, Maria, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned COVAX because uh, Mohamed Dia watching us was asking if WHO is part of the COVAX, and yes, WHO is part of the COVAX, and we work with partners to actually deliver on, on vaccine equity, um, but we can also provide information um, in writing, and we invite you to, to uh, visit our, our website. Um, Maria, looking maybe into other regions as well, uh, Americas is the region with the highest increase in cases and deaths. Um, so how, how are we supporting countries to, to improve this situation? Well, there's a combination of factors of why we're seeing increasing case, cases around the world. There's four major factors. The first are these variants of concern. Um, so there are four variants of concern that WHO is tracking. Um, the latest one is the Delta variant, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. Of, heard a lot about. Um, it does have increased transmissibility. So if you have increased transmissibility, you will have more cases. Um, but this is happening in the context of uneven vaccine distribution and vaccine use, which means a large proportion of the world remains susceptible to infection. Um, if you have both of those factors also in the context of increased mixing, increased social mobility where people are coming into contact with, it, with one another more, and you're not using appropriate public health and social measures, these four factors are an incredibly dangerous situation. And we're seeing this play out across the world. Um, and so if you have increased transmissibility in the variants, if you, have, you don't have the vaccines being used around the world, increasing social mixing and inappropriate use of public health and social measures, the virus will thrive. And that's what we're seeing um, in all regions of the world, including in the Americas. We work through our regional offices, our six regional offices. We work through our country offices to provide support to countries before surges happen to really be better prepared. Um, and, you know, 19 months into a pandemic, we all know what can happen. And so what we're trying to do is ensure that our guidance is being used, that countries have the, the right supplies in place, and that those supplies could be used. So it's not just about tests, for example, having a certain number of tests in there, although that it's very important that we have access to tests, including rapid antigen-based tests, but there has to be the system in place to use them the training of the, of the health workers or even community-based workers to do those tests. And those test results have to come back quickly and link to public health action. That's what saves the lives, not just a positive or a negative test result, but actually doing something about that. And so we're working with our, part, with, um, our member states through the ministries of health and through our partners on the ground, um, including our WHO staff all around the world, thousands of WHO staff around the world and our partners to make sure that you know, the tests are used, for example, and that they link to those public health actions. It's the same thing with personal protective equipment. It's the same thing with therapeutics and oxygen, you know, to be able to have those used appropriately. So we provide support through um, trainings, through the guidance itself, um, through helping uh, build facilities and, and structure those uh, facilities to care for patients um, and access to supplies. So we do a lot of different types of support. Again, uh, WHO and also our partners are providing that support. It's really dynamic, Alex. Um, it isn't sort of one thing that we do, um, but we are really, you know, just a shout out to all of our WHO staff out there who are working incredibly hard. Um, we thank you every day uh, for what you're doing and to our regional off office staff, you know, the same. So we try to tailor the approach to what's needed. Thank you so much, Maria. You mentioned the Delta variant mm -hmm. and that it is more transmissible than others. So I have a few questions from our viewers. One is um, actually coming from, uh, sorry, there are quite a lot. Um, uh, Sasha St. Clair, uh, what is the difference in, in variants and in particular from the main, the difference between the main COVID-19 strain and the Delta one? And the second question is actually, um, 
coming from uh, oh I'm trying to to put it together I'm so sorry anyways the I, I'm trying actually to find the name of, of a viewer but the question is um, why is Delta more than dangerous than other or previous trains and it's coming from Purnananda Lai Mayan thank you for the question so these are two great questions. So um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus and, and it evolves over time. So the more it spreads, it changes a little bit each time. And this is expected because viruses change. It's called virus evolution. Um, and we've seen over the course of the last 19 month changes in the virus. And what we're looking for is which changes are important and why. Um, the variants that we are describing are viruses, they're SARS-CoV-2 viruses that have several changes, mutations in those, in those viruses. Um, and we have a group of virologists and epidemiologists and clinicians that are looking at each of the viruses themselves. And what we call a variant um, is a strain. Um, that has several different mutations. So the Delta variant has a number of mutations and deletions, you know, in in the code of it, and uh, and that's what we're tracking. That's why we call them different names. There are different scientific names for all of those, but we we're using the Greek alphabet right now to try to help in our communication. From a public's point of view, they're all the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and all of them are dangerous. Um, so any virus that is circulating in, in your area, whether it's the ancestral strain, the first virus you know that was identified, or the Delta variant, or the or any any future changes, is a dangerous virus. Um, the question about Delta, uh, what we know about Delta is that there is increased transmissibility. We have a lot of meetings about the Delta variant. I mean daily, and we're trying to understand why is the Delta variant more transmissible. There are these mutations, these changes. Um, that, for example, you know, will allow the virus to adhere to a cell more easily and infect the cell more readily. But we also want to know why, like when, when somebody is infected with Delta, why do they transmit more efficiently than someone else? Um, and so we're working across lots of different disciplines to understand this. Um, for Delta, um, we know that people who are infected with the Delta variant have higher viral load, they have more virus in them. Um, which is a really important finding because it's, they, can, they can transmit more easily if you have more virus. The way the virus spreads hasn't changed, but if you have more virus, then it's easier to pass between people. That's just an example. Um, in terms of severity, we have seen some countries suggest that there is increased risk of hospitalization um, for people who are infected with the Delta variant. But we haven't seen that translate to increased death so increased mortality, meaning the number of people infected with Delta have not died more often than with the other strains. Um, it still can be a deadly virus. The risk factors for severe disease and death are the same. You know, if you have underlying medical conditions, if, of course, if you're not vaccinated, um, you have a higher risk, especially if you have, are of older age. And our countermeasures still work. It just it means we have to use them really um, consciously. And if you, have, if you are offered the vaccine, please take it and please take your full course. Um, if it's a two dose regimen, please receive that second dose because again, our vaccines are incredibly effective even against the Delta variant. And this is important. I want viewers to know that, they, that our countermeasures work. Um, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there, especially you know in the last week with all of the different news that's out there. Um, there are so many global problems. COVID-19 has solutions. We have solutions right now that we need to use. We need to be conscious about using them um, and we need global equity in using them. And I think that's the message. This is a big challenge at a global level, but we have solutions that, that can bring this virus under control. Thank you, Maria. I would use the chance. I know you've said this many times um, and even accused of being a broken record, but <laughs> let's do it once again. Uh, what each of us can do to stay safe or minimize our risk from COVID-19, including from the Delta variant. So I, I am a broken record, but I will continue to be a broken record because I think it's good that we we, we emphasize this. Um, you know, we follow the science, and and this is my job. This is what I do. I work with people around the world, and we look at the science. We try to block out the noise, focus on what we need to do, and we know that you can keep yourself safe. First thing to do, first thing is to prevent infections. If you can keep yourself safe from getting infected. Um, and you can do this a number of ways. It's individual level measures, 
physical distancing. You know, keep your distance from others, at least one meter. The further, the better. Spend more time outdoors than indoors because we know indoors is riskier and there's a greater possibility, especially if you have poor ventilation. We're in a very well ventilated area right now, but in closed rooms with poor ventilation, the virus can spread more easily through aerosols, through droplets, especially if you spend longer periods of time. Wearing a mask. And make sure when you wear a mask, you have clean hands. So when you put your mask on, make sure that you have a good fit. The fit is really important for a mask. Cover your nose and cover your mouth. Make sure you don't have a lot of pockets. Um, so make sure it fits your face and that you keep wearing it over your nose and your mouth. And if you touch your mask, use make sure you have clean hands. Um, avoided crowded spaces. Uh, avoid crowds. So, um, you know, as much as you can, and I know we all want to sort of get back to being social, avoid those crowds for now. Um, you want to minimize your contact with other people. Get vaccinated. Um, when it's your turn, um, you know, please get vaccinated and receive the full course of that vaccination. So there's a lot that we can do. Follow your local guidance. Um, follow what is being said because, as I mentioned at the start, the transmission dynamics are very different. And I know it's confusing where we say do this and then maybe change it slightly. But it is a dynamic situation and we want to really give people you know, options. If you can work from home, work from home. Um, if you are feeling unwell, stay home, contact your medical provider, get tested. Um, there's a lot of more, more access to tests these days, so we need to utilize that. Thank you so much, Maria. You were also talking about how virus changes um, and why we are seeing new, new variants. However, uh, Yoko Pamunkas was asking, what triggers those changes of a virus? So it's natural that the virus you know, changes over time as it passes between people. There are changes that happen, these mutations that happen. There are a couple of different ways um, where the virus could, could perhaps change uh, that, we're, that we're looking at. One is when you have a, a lot of transmission um, if you have a lot of transmission in an area and the virus is passing between people, there's more possibility for variants to emerge. Um, the second area that we're looking at, you know, is if the virus uh, enters animal populations. If you remember last year, we had this cluster five variant um, related to mink populations, um, and mink are very susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, and it can spread very easily between mink. And we always look when it passes between humans and animals and animals to humans, you could have an increased risk of these mutations or these variants emerging. Um, we also look at long, you know, infection in people. And if they are infectious for long periods of time, immunocompromised individuals, for example, you could have variants. So we really need to drive transmission down. We need to do everything that we can to minimize transmission between people because that will minimize the risk of variants emerging. And vaccines play a role in that too. So even though they're focused on preventing severe disease and death, we are seeing some positive effects um, you know, in terms of re reduction in infection and also transmission. Even though that's not what they're primarily being used for, we are seeing some positive results there too. Thank you so much, um, Maria. Um, and Nai from the US, I think watching us on LinkedIn, is asking how are we preparing for new and maybe may even more transmissible variants? So th there's, a, uh, there's a lot that's going on in this area. It first starts with surveillance. You know, we need to really understand uh, where the virus is circulating, variants or not. Um, and this starts with good, robust surveillance around the world. Who is infected with this virus? Making sure that we have good testing, robust testing. The use of not only PCR-based testing, but these rapid antigen-based tests. And a subset of the samples that are tested need to be sequenced. Um, so we are working with partners around the world through our regions to increase sequencing capacity. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have um, a complete set of eyes and ears around the world to know where these variants can emerge, but that is improving. Um, and there's a lot of investment that's, that's being made now to improve sequencing capacities worldwide for SARS-CoV-2, which will be beneficial for any future infectious pathogen. This is really key. The next is important aspect is assessment. So not only monitoring and tracking where these viruses are and what those changes are, but which ones are important and why. So not all mutations are going to be important. So we are assessing each of these mutations and variants. We have four variants of concern. We have four variants of interest that we are tracking, and we have a number of more than 50 alerts you know, that we're looking at to see what do they mean? Are they important or not? And we're looking to see, is there a change in the epidemiology? 
you know, is, is it are there outbreaks that are occurring where they shouldn't be because there are interventions in place? Um, is there a change in severity? Um, any kind of you know disease presentation change or change in the rates of hospitalization or death? Um, do we see any uh, changes in the impacts of our countermeasures? Are our, our public health and social measures, where those are in place, are they working or not? And if they're not working, why? Um, and of course, do our diagnostics work, do our therapeutics work, do our vaccines work? So we have a global tracking system, a monitoring and assessment framework that exists, that, glo that WHO has set up to work with partners around the world to try to do this literally almost in real time. Uh, we had an R&D blueprint for epidemics meeting um, last week, uh, no, this week, um, on variants, maybe it was last week, the days are still blurring for me, um, to monitor, you know, what do we know about vaccines? And is there a need for a booster? You know, are the vaccines still working? And so this is happening in real time, and we're so grateful for partners because they're sharing this information before it's published in the peer-reviewed literature. And this is important for, for WHO because the policies need to be need to be set very quickly. So it's a, it's a long-winded answer because there's a lot going on and it involves a lot of different people around the world. Thank you very much, Maria. The meeting was last Friday. Friday, thank Friday. you. Thank you very um, much. But thank you. And there is a question that is re re related to vaccinated population and our viewer on LinkedIn is asking, if vaccinated, how would the person know if they have been infected? Are there common symptoms emerging from vaccinated people or they are the same like for non-vaccinated so people? What we're seeing in vaccinated people is it prevents, you know, very effective against preventing severe disease and death. Um, it isn't always 100% effective, and there is no vaccine that is 100% effective, but they're really very highly effective for hospitalization. So these are people who have severe disease and for people who are dying. But you may have some individuals, even vaccinated, that still could be infected, and they could have some mild disease. Um, and if you know, I'm, you know, the COVID-19 has a very wide range of symptoms from asymptomatic infection, meaning no symptoms at all, all the way through severe pneumonia and, and people dying. So, you know, some of the common, more mild features of it include, you know, fatigue, um, you know, sore throat, fever. Um, some people have a cough, some people sneeze, um, loss of taste, loss of smell. Um, so it's a variety of different factors. If you're feeling unwell, even if you've been vaccinated, it would be a good idea to get tested, you know, in the area that you live so that we can, we can track that and we can see, you know, how many of these infections are happening amongst vaccinated people. But you have a much lower risk of getting infected after being vaccinated than not being vaccinated. And we know you have a very low risk of, of developing severe disease and dying by getting vaccinated. So get that vaccine when you can. Thank you, Maria. I would just add also what's important to take the full course of, of doses for maximum um, protection. Depending on the vaccine, there is a one single dose vaccine, but the rest of them uh, require two, two doses at the moment. And that's important, especially for the Delta variant, because given this virus you know, is circulating and it's predominant, if it's not already predominant worldwide, and I say if it's not already because we don't have the sequencing you know, available everywhere, it will likely be the dominant virus that's circulating worldwide. And so getting that second dose gives you the full protection for the, for the vaccines that require two doses, of course. Thank you so much, Maria. Here is a, one more question from a LinkedIn viewer about the personal protective equipment mm -hmm. and whether there are some changes in, in those recommendations given the transmissibility of the Delta variant. So that's a fantastic question. Um, we discussed that regularly. Um, we look not only at the personal protective equipment, but everything. We, in fact, I think it's safe to say that every single piece of guidance that WHO is involved in is looking with fresh eyes um, in, in light of two factors, more, more factors. The science, of course, um, but the additional two factors are the variants and what do the variants change in terms of our understanding about transmission or how it spreads or why it spreads more efficiently and also vaccination coverage. So in terms of PPE, personal protective equipment, the use of masks, the use of respirators, our infection prevention and control guideline development group meets regularly on this. They've had many discussions looking at um, the use of personal protective equipment and hospital outbreaks, for example, and looking at the Delta variant or not. They're going to be making some recommendations going forward. Um, we know right now that our personal protective equipment, our IPC measures, and also our public health and social measures work against the Delta variant. And that's really important, but they have to be used. 
So if someone is wearing a mask, they need to be wearing an appropriate mask with filtration, the right filtration. It needs to cover the nose and mouth. There needs to be good fit. There needs to be good filtration and there needs to be breathability. So it's not necessarily about how many layers, it's about the right number of right amount of protection. And if those who are required to wear respirators, they need to be fit tested. This is really important. I see a lot of people wearing respirators out on the street, but they're not worn appropriately and that's not protecting you. So if you're going to wear something across your face, whether it's a fabric mask, whether it's a medical mask, or whether it's a respirator, please make sure it's worn properly um, because we're seeing a lot of inappropriate use. But our guideline development group, they'll be making some, um, they'll be issuing an update of the recommendations uh, pretty soon. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, speaking again of changes and, 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 and variants, there was a question from one of the viewers, what do we know about the Lamba? And there was another question, whether the Lamba variant can also cause severe disease and death. So this is a good question. So all of the viruses and all of the variants of interest and variants of concern can infect you. And if you are infected with them, they can cause severe disease. Um, our understanding of the Lambda variant, which is a variant of interest uh, that we're tracking globally, um, not only do we look at you know severity and all that, we also look at how much it's circulating. Our understanding of the Lambda variant is in the countries where it has been detected, primarily in the Americas, um, it's going down. The prevalence of the Lambda variant is going down, is reducing, and the Delta variant um, is really increasing. The Delta variant, it, everywhere that it um, is identified, it quickly replaces other variants that are circulating. So they may be referring to some preprints or some studies that are coming out that are looking at some of the mutations and looking at um, its impacts. Uh, but our understanding that it's really, so it's, I wouldn't say it's necessarily dying out, but it's reducing and Delta is just very efficient. So wherever Delta is found, um, it's replacing the other circulating strains. Thank you, Maria. The one, we're also seeing uh, some coverage and, and uh, what's happening in, in Southeast Asia with the Delta variant that young children under five years old have been affected and, and that many have died, that many died. So um, what do we know about this and how children are impacted by the Delta variant? This is also a good question, Alex. I mean, it's it's very concerning some of the reports that we're hearing, you know, about children, um, pediatric populations, and adolescents being hospitalized. Um, what we understand is when the Delta variant is circulating, um, if there are groups that are mixing that are out, um, that are susceptible, they will get infected, and so we don't we we see infection increase across multiple age groups, including in children. And when you have very high case numbers, even in young populations, you'll have a large number of cases, unfortunately. Um, and if you have increased cases, you'll have increased hospitalizations. What we do know from the Delta variant is the same with adults. In children, if you have underlying conditions, no matter what age you are, you're at an increased risk of hospitalization. We know no matter what age you are, if there are inequalities that exist before, um, you know, before this pandemic have now been exacerbated during this pandemic, this will result in increased hospitalization. And that can include children. We can't forget, you know, that children also have underlying conditions. Um, and the other factor, I think, is when you have increased transmission, when you have increased case numbers, no matter what age group that is, if those individuals need hospitalization, it could quickly overburden a healthcare system. And if the healthcare workers who are the, the real heroes in all of this, if they're not able to provide the care that they need to the patients, it will have a result on, on poorer outcomes, meaning more people will die. So what we're trying to understand for the Delta variant, we don't see the Delta variant specifically targeting children, you know, from different age groups, but we do see um, that if you are increased mixing, um, if there is a lot of transmission in the community, and if in those communities there isn't vaccination in the older age groups, the virus will really thrive. Um, I should say overall, in general, we do still see more mild disease and asymptomatic infection in children, but we are tracking all of this very, very carefully. We're working with our clinical management group, um, our maternal and child health group, with UNICEF to really articulate what are we seeing. Um, these reports are critically important, but we need to know what, what it's due to. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot that we're watching in this space. But we know we can keep kids safe. So that's, that's what we focus. That's what we need to focus on. Any child that's infected is, is really heartbreaking. Thank you, Maria. I, I, 
can't, can't agree more on that. Um, you spoke about different masks and, and prevention, and we have Amy from uh, watching us on LinkedIn asking, is there an easy chart universal showing how to wear all types of masks? And I would just use the opportunity to, to tell Amy that you can find them on our website or on our social media channels. If you go on the website, who.int, the top on the website are COVID information, and you can find advice for public, um, how to protect yourself, and there is a whole section on masks that has various infographics and also videos demonstrating on how to, to use different type of, of masks, but we can also provide you with links. Um, Maria, there is one interesting question from one of the viewers, if um, one person can be infected with different variants at the same time. I mean, it's certainly possible that people could be infected with different versions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, it's hard to track because um, you need sequencing to be done. Um, it doesn't seem to be common, uh, but we don't have good surveillance on that. Again, I think from a general public point of view, if the virus is circulating in your area, you need to know what your risk is and you need to take steps to lower your risk. That's the bottom line. So variants or not, I know it's scary. I mean, these these variants are, are, are scary and the idea of virus evolution and it's changing. And I just want the people out there that are watching this to know that they can keep themselves safe. I mean, for the most part, it's about how we we go through our day and we have to live our lives. But how do we do that as safely as possible? Um, and there's a number of ways that that, that, that can be done. Thank you, Maria. Um, one of the viewers is, is asking as well whether we know that the vaccine is um, decreasing a viral load if, if we get infected. So I, I, that's a great question. So my understanding is yes, but I know you had a recent uh, Q&A with Kate O'Brien. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of very good videos on that. I like to stick in my lane in terms of my expertise. Um, but yes, I mean, I mean, the whole point is to what we want to do, what the vaccines are working to do is to prevent severe disease, which means to reduce your risk of being hospitalized and to reduce your risk of dying. And that's what they do. Um, and even though, you know, they were developed very quickly in relative terms, they're based on decades worth of work. Um, and they're based on a lot of collaboration, clinical trials that has not changed, you know, in terms of the safety profile. And so really we encourage you to get vaccinated uh, when you can. And look, let's, let's be blunt here. There's a lot of people around the world that are, want the vaccine. There are countries in the world that are ready to vaccinate and they don't have access to the vaccines. So let's think about this. I mean, I know everyone is really focused on themselves and their families, but this is a global problem and we need global solutions. We will not solve this in one country alone. It has to be solved at a global level. Thank you, Maria. And before we close, um, we've seen some reports as well that European, some of the European countries are preparing on how to live with this virus in a longer term. So. Does it mean that this virus will stay with us forever? And actually, one of the viewers is asking, how likely is for COVID-19 to be endemic? So these are these are questions that we're grappling with right now. I mean, I really, I have to say, I don't like the phrase living with the virus. To me, it, it almost feels like we've given up. But at the same time, what we're thinking through are these different scenarios. What, what will COVID-19 look like, you know, in the next three, six, nine months? What are the possible scenarios that we, we can look through? Um, and it's very possible, because we have the tools right now, that we could drive transmission down so low, and in fact, we can minimize um, the severity. You know, we could minimize the deaths because we have these tools. We have enough vaccines to be able to do that in those who are most at risk around the world. We just haven't used them um, properly. Um, it can become endemic, it may become endemic, but that doesn't mean that the virus is everywhere all the time at this level. It means that it is in, it is in specific locations, specific geographic areas. And I can envision many different types of futures. I hope that we can drive transmission down as quickly as possible so that we have minimal levels of transmission around, we use the vaccines you know, to prevent the severe disease and death, and we get on with our lives. But we cannot do that with sort of this start and stop um, approach. Um, and I think you've heard both Mike and I talk a lot about we don't want to move from lockdown to lockdown to lockdown. Um, I think what we need is 
to really tailor the approach to where it's needed. It isn't about when is the next lockdown versus when is everything lifted. We have to move out of that cycle. I am concerned, I am concerned about, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a lot of travel that's happening right now. There's a lot of non-essential travel that's happening right now, and that's going to have an impact. We're already seeing you know, increases in transmission. All of these actions matter. So how do we better prepare? As an organization, we are looking at the next three, six, nine months. What will COVID-19 look like in the context of how much vaccine is available, how these vaccines are being used, um, the variants that are circulating and what they mean for our countermeasures, how the public health and social measures are being applied, because this is how we're going to need to tailor our approach. Even though you know we have thousands of people that work at WHO, we're very limited in our capacities because this problem is everywhere. And we are grateful for all of our partners to work on this, but you know we're all exhausted. Um, we want this to be over, but we need to start thinking through this. I think there's no inevitability. It doesn't mean the virus doesn't have to do one thing or another. It really is in our hands. Thank you so much, Maria. I will take the very last question uh, coming from Lana Brueggemann. How, uh, what would be your advice to convince a 76-year-old woman to get the, her vaccine as she's been um, seeing a lot of and various conspiracy theories um, watching on YouTube and not, she's not encouraged to, to get vaccinated? So that's a good question too. I mean, I get all good questions today and thanks for all of the viewer questions coming in. Um, you know, we're not here to really convince anyone to do anything. What we want to do is really understand the questions. You know, what information is she, is she hearing? Um, is it good information? And really to correct that information. What I can say is that the vaccines that are available are very safe and very effective and vaccines save lives. So I would encourage anyone if you are offered a vaccine to please get vaccinated because it will save your life and it's not only about you it's about you and your loved ones um, and so you know let's use the tools that we can at hand i would have a conversation um, with this person and i would really try to understand what information is, is is she hearing so then we can we can talk through it i think part of it is engagement and listening um, there's there's too much misinformation out there and there's too much information being used you know, to drive one agenda or another. We need to stop that. We really do because it's, it's killing people. So let's use the tools we can and save as many lives as we can. Thank you so much, Maria, for your time, for great answers. And I thank to all our viewers watching us from Mexico, Kenya, Iran, India, the US, Cameroon, Uganda, Ghana, France, Italy, UK, Canada, Trinidad and Tobago, Egypt, Zimbabwe, Argentina, Thailand, Mozambique, Solomon Islands, Indonesia, Austria, Nigeria, Lebanon, and many others. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for following our advice and for sharing our advice um, with your friends and your loved ones so that they can also uh, make the right choices on how to stay safe and, and help each other during this difficult time. Thank you so much. And until next week, stay safe.